And so basically they'll say the uh, vestigial traits that we find. Oh, here it is. Vestigial structures. So they actually follow up their homology with this. So they'll say, this is from the article, we can also look at the bodies of animals today and find features that are similar to what other animals have, but which no longer seem to function or have different. <laughs> notice, notice how they've revised history. They revised their definition, Jerry, because yeah. now we find that all of these structures and organs have essential functions. So now they've redefined vestigial trait as meaning not necessarily having no function, but maybe they've altered their function or have a different function. So they put that in brackets. Anyway, so they say scientists call these vestigial traits. What's a good response to this argument, Jerry? Well, that surprised me. I taught anatomy for, I don't know, 20 years, and I used a number of different textbooks, and I reviewed a number of textbooks. And one thing I always looked for was, in the index, the word vestigial. It wasn't in any of them. And when I looked at the so-called vestigial organs, the appendix, for example, none of them mentioned that any of these structures were vestigial. The section on the appendix talks about the five different functions of the appendix. This section on the oscoxic talked about the different functions for the oscoxic. None of the arguments that they commonly use for <laughs> the vestigial organ were talked about as being vestigial. They were all talked about as... <laughs> Sorry, their function in humans. And therefore, I just find it intriguing. And yet, if you look at the biology books published by the same publisher, there typically is a chapter on vestigial organs, or at least a section on vestigial organs. So why the anatomists agree that there's no vestigial organs, not in the book. If there was, they would include them. And none of the books had any reference to vestigial. And they all had the explanation of what we now realize they are for. So why is the anatomy book so consistent? They're not there. And the, bio, the, sorry, the biology books, why are they so consistent in claiming the vestigial organ idea? And I just found that intriguing when I reviewed that book. Typically you get each year, you get three or four new anatomy books and you review them to see whether or not you want to use the same book again next year. And so I got, I got a whole box full of, several boxes full of anatomy books. So among anatomists, the, the, the vestigial idea, from what I know, is not there. You talk about vestigial organs, anatomists will look at you wondering, uh, what planet are you from? Clearly, all these structures have important functions. And they don't talk about vestigial functions at all. They talk about the uses of all of these structures in humans today. So if anything, evolution hinders scientific advancement. Because we expect does. to find treasure, they expect to find junk and evolutionary leftovers. There's a lot of organs that were claimed to be vestigial, but were found to be not only not vestigial, but critical for good health. The thymus, for example, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. So many of these believed to be vestigial, we now know are not only not vestigial, but very, very important. And that was, one of them was discovered by a doctor who they used to remove parts, I think, of the thymus, remove parts of the thymus, and they noticed that they ended up developing some problems as a result of this. In one case, they were twins, and the, and the one twin, the, twin, the entire thymus was removed, and the other twin, only part of it was. And they noticed in time how they developed very differently. And they concluded from this, which now we know is true, that these structures are really very important. You cannot remove them without a problem in the long run. I've heard them as a counter rebuttal. They'll say, well, the reason why we know or can say that these vestigial organs or structures have simply acquired a new function or changed its original function is because, and they'll point to an example like the appendix, they'll say the appendix has a different function in different creatures. So depending on what you're looking for, maybe a carnivore or herbivore or a human and a chimpanzee, sure, they admit that the appendix has a function, but it simply acquired 
a new function or else the function would be the same in every creature. What, what's a good response to that? Well, that's again, another explanation they're trying to use to explain it away. It reminds me of my cat film I watched with them. I'll show a cat that survives so well in Antarctica. Cat survives really well. And they'll say, well, this cat was eventually evolved into this cat we see now from this other cat. But of course they had no evidence for that. They had no, no evidence at all. But they did, of course, show quite well that there are some cats that have such an effective fat and fur covering that in the Antarctica, really, really cold, 20 degrees below zero, they have to find places to cool off. They get so warm. And they'll find a log that's covered with uh, snow, for example, and they'll lay on the log to help cool off because they're so effective in being able to retain heat in these very, very cold areas. And... Uh, and they say, well, they evolved from this other cat from Africa. And that's, but of course, they don't know that. That's just an assumption. But they know they're very, very different. And you have to wonder how this cat from Africa survived in this 20 degree below zero temperature weather in Antarctica. How could they survive? Well, they don't know. Of course, that, but that's what they hypothesize. They have to come up with an evolutionary explanation. And that's a good example, which I guess if you watch that, it would, seem to really prove evolution but in fact and of course i can look at this critically but in fact it did not at all in any single case prove evolution from one cat to another cat they just hypothesized that this cat evolved into this other cat and that's yep. the end of their, their claim a lot, of, a lot of storytelling variation in designs in the biological world is again what i'd expect Human engineers design variations as well. I mean, you can get a Volkswagen Jetta with, uh, with a diesel, I mean, maybe not anymore, or, or with a regular engine. You can get uh, your car with a whole variety of steering. How come here in, Amer in North America, we drive on the left side of the road, but in Britain, you drive on the right side of the road? Same function, same vehicle, just uh, variations in that. And so this evolutionist in the chat, He's been very energetic, <laughs> uh, bringing up a lot of these arguments that we've addressed, but he's pretty adamant about them and he wants us to address them. So let's address these all, uh, leave no stone unturned. And he's put these all here for us. So he says, we have loads of evidence. We've observed evolution via genetic mutations. Well, you started off the show, Jerry, for 30 minutes or so showing why no. Mutations are not going to help take your fish to fishermen. They're not going to help explain the necessary vertical changes that evolutionists would need. They're largely deleterious. Most are nearly neutral. They build up, they degenerate. Gene duplication. Okay, fair enough. We haven't talked about that one today, and that is on my list. So gene duplication, Jerry, they'll say, well, you could have a region of the genome or a, a sequence. You can have a large gene duplication, a smaller gene duplication. And that duplicated region, they call it neo-functionalization. They'll say that duplicated region can now experience novel mutations, beneficial mutations, and thus altering it from its, its original sequence and evolve a, a new function. What, what's a good response to that? The main problem with that is that when you have genes that duplicate, and of course that does happen at times, certain diseases are a common problem is due to gene du duplication. But when you have that occur, what we see is that the hotspots in one gene, it duplicates. The same hotspots are often found in the other gene. And so therefore, you have an equal likelihood of this damage in one gene as well as the other gene. The claim is, is that if you have a gene duplication, the one gene can function, do what it's supposed to. The other gene can mutate and do something else in time. Well, that doesn't work. There have been no clear examples of that. In fact, what we know is in general, when it, this occurs, it causes a problem. It doesn't solve any problem. And that's partially because, because mutations are just as likely in the duplicated gene as in the other gene. And that's what often happens. Not always, but that's what often happens. So biologos, it's basically the same argument that you just demolished, but now they apply it to the genome. They call it genetic scars. So this is right from BioLogos, Jerry. So they say just as scars stay on our bodies, right? The vestigial traits that you just uh, debunked. 
just as scars stay on our bodies as reminders of past events, the DNA code also contains scars, and these are passed on from generation to generation. They say DNA scars result from the deletion or insertion of a block of bases. I want to say this, Jerry, before you respond. There's two very different explanations from the evolutionists and the creationists when it comes to the origin of genetic diversity. Evolutionists, they explain all genetic variation as being the result of mutations over time. So they look to DNA differences and they explain those as mutations. But we as creationists, we look to the vast majority of DNA variation, specifically autosomal nuclear DNA variation, as being the result of initial design, created heterozygosity. So where they say something like a deletion or a substitution or an insertion, they're simply inferring based on their worldview presuppositions that these are a mutation. So I do want to make that clear to any evolutionists in the chat. Just because you say deletion or just because you say mutation does not necessarily mean that that's a mutation. Or if they look at a, a spot in the human genome, Jerry, where there's a DNA uh, unit missing, but it's in the chimpanzee line, well, they'll say, well, the reason why it's missing is because either it was added or it was deleted. Or maybe it was never there. <laughs> they won't yeah. even question that one. So anyways, they say because we have a lot of these, hundreds of thousands, and they can be precisely located, they serve as a historical record of species. So basically they say we share these genetic scars or genetic mistakes with chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, also known as pseudogenes. And so we must have inherited those from common ancestors. What's a good response, Jerry? Well, what we find is over and over, these so-called pseudogenes, as well as some of these others, are simply a design function which has a purpose. And uh, it's like labeling things vestigial. We label them vestigial, and then later on we find they have a function, a use. And I think a lot of these so-called damage is, and it could be damage, that's not the, the debate, it could be damage. I mean, we accept uh, the accumulation of mutations is, has been occurring since Adam and Eve. So therefore, there, there is damage to it. But on the other hand, you got to be careful in assuming this is damage when it indeed does have an important function. And the lesson for that is what we know about vestigial organs. We've started out with 100 around the turn of the last century, and now we have zero. So therefore, from 100 to zero, through more knowledge. And so my supposition is, as we get more knowledge about these so-called damaged genes, we may change our mind. They may not be damaged. It's a judgment someone's making. And and there could be some. I mean, we don't deny there's some damaged genes. After all, we have 6,000 years of mutation. So there's some that are there. But on the other hand, got to be careful. They may not be all, or most of them may not be damaged. Most of them may be a result of design, which appears to be damaged. You nailed it. You, and, and that is oftentimes put forth by more informed PhD evolutionists as one of their best lines of evidence for evolution. And no, we're finding that a lot of these so-called genetic scars are not genetic scars. William Lane Craig, well-known theistic evolutionist, he's, he's great at some things, but he's wrong on evolution. He looks to pseudogenes as well. So it needs to be countered, and you did so. We have We've documented the fact that many of these are necessary to sustain healthy life processes. Many evolutionists have said, well, why do the pseudogenes look like their healthy counterparts, Jerry? But I could pull up at least two papers that sh uh, demonstrate that this, uh, the pseudogene expression actually helps to regulate the translation of its protein coding counterpart. And therefore it has to look like its counterpart to be able to help with, with that function. That's a good, good example, a good point. So there you go. Pseudogenes debunked. Same thing goes with all of your other so-called junk DNA. We, we know there's a, there's a lot of functions that, that they did not expect or predict. ERVs, functional in gene expression, embryological development, functional in the, in the immune system, tumor suppression. So there's ERVs, pseudogenes, ALU sequences, same thing, junk DNA in general. So, you know, there, there's a quick in a nutshell debunking of those of those points. So.